Hi there, this is Professor Schimmel back for part three. Uh, I hope it's the last part of functional anatomy of prokaryotic cells. We left off with the um, uh, bacterial cell wall when I ended the last segment and specifically with um, acid fast bacteria. Um, just for the record, I wanted to mention that today is July 7th, 2015. It's 8.30 a.m. Uh, I'm here at home in my kitchen while my, um, my dogs and my cats uh, nap in the air conditioning. Um, recording this video for you guys. I also wanted to say thank you to, um, there've been, there's been a steady stream of people from all over the world uh, subscribing to my channel. I appreciate it. I hope that you're finding these videos helpful and um, uh, glad to have you. Okay guys, so let's pick it up with uh, the next page in your handout should look like this. Uh, microbiological staining techniques, some basic information. Now I just want to point out that this is not every bit of information about the staining techniques that I have listed here. This is intended as an introduction to the concept of staining microorganisms and um, also many of these techniques give differential results, meaning we can either identify a specific group of bacteria or divide bacteria into di different groups. Uh, so let's look at this together. Yes, you're responsible for this for your lecture exam and that would include, as always in my lectures, all of the examples of um, organisms that are that are mentioned along the way. All right, first on the list is simple staining. Now we're not trying to uh, do anything differential or diagnostic with this technique. All we're doing is staining bacterial cells to provide some contrast to make it a little easier to uh, to view them. Uh, they are tiny, of course, we've addressed that already, and they are transparent, and so uh, trying to view them microscopically is difficult unless we have a little bit of contrast. So that's what we're doing with simple staining. Now you can use any of a number of stains, but you only use one stain. And uh, one example, or a couple of examples, I guess I've got in, your, um, in that table I provided would be stains such as methylene blue or crystal violet. Possible reactions, there aren't any, like positive or negative. Um, and so there is, of course, no example of a, um, of a positive. Uh, negative staining is next, sometimes also referred to as capsule staining. And you know what capsules are. We've talked about them already. So the um, intent of this technique is to demonstrate the presence or the absence of capsules. The primary stain, that means the first one that we use in the technique, is one called India ink. And when we're done with the negative staining technique, the bacteria are either going to have capsules, in which case we say they're positive for capsules, or they will not have capsules, negative for capsules. And you've got a couple of examples in your notes of bacteria that do produce capsules. They are um, actually both pathogenic, and they are um, Klebsiella pneumoniae and Staphylococcus aureus. All right, gram staining. Again, we've talked about this one a little bit. We are dividing uh, this enormous group of organisms known as the bacteria into two groups. The basis for the division is the structure of their cell wall. Uh, and so gram-positive cells, they have those many layers of peptidoglycan, tachoic acids, um, kind of woven through the peptidoglycan lattice. And then gram-negative cells have that um, periplasmic space and that um, uh, outer membrane. Anyway, so, um, as it says in your note, separates bacterial species based on cell wall structure. The primary stain for this technique is called Graham's crystal violet. Not just crystal violet, there are many formulations of crystal violet and other stains as well. And this one is uh, specific for Gram staining. Now when we're all done with the technique, Gram positive cells will stain purple or blue and gram negative cells red or pink. There are some examples. A gram positive organism is Staphylococcus aureus and a gram negative one is the bacillus known as Escherichia coli. All right, um, endospore staining is next. We haven't talked about endospores yet, but that'll be coming up in a few minutes. Also known as the Schaefer-Fulton method of staining, we're looking for the presence of the still mysterious endospore, um, and the primary stain in this technique is called malachite green. Now, if all goes well, and we don't always have the success that we want with endospore staining in the lab, and I'll talk more about that when I get to endospores in a few minutes. But anyways, if all goes well, at the end of the technique, the endospores will have stained green, 
and the vegetative cells that that refers to the um, the active metabolically reproduction wise uh, the vegetative cell will stain red or pink and a bacterium that produces endospores is um, bacillus subtilis there are many others some are pathogenic uh, and then finally on this table is the technique known as acid fast staining. I explained what that meant a few minutes ago, also known as the Zeal Nielsen method of staining. Now, um, we're trying to identify these bacteria that are referred to as being acid fast, talked about how seriously pathogenic and drug resistant uh, they can be, and the primary stain is carbal fusion. Now, at the end of the technique, acid fast cells will stain red, um, actually, fuchsia, kind of a purpley red, would be technically more correct. And then non-acid fast cells would stain blue. An example of a bacterium that's acid fast is um, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So it looks like that's the only example I've provided for you. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. We are um, actually inside the cell wall now. Uh, so let's go ahead and pick up that discussion with the cytoplasmic membrane. And you've got a diagram, I think you do anyways, in your notes here. In any event, you could, yeah, you do. You could look back at the, um, the gram-positive, gram-negative cell wall diagram. There's a more detailed uh, diagram of the plasma membrane there, but we go with this for now. Anyways, um, all bacteria, all cells have a plasma membrane, cell membrane, plasma membrane, cytoplasmic membrane, synonymous terms. And if there is a cell wall present, the cell membrane will lie inside of that cell wall. Uh, it's often described as being a phospholipid bilayer. And if you look at um, the diagram of the cell wall, you see these funny kind of little structures. They look like this. All right, and this represents a phospholipid um, molecule there. So uh, the, um, the cell wall is made up of a phospholipid bilayer. So we've got two layers of those phospholipids and um, made up of um, some uh, lipids, some protein, phosphates, and uh, the plasma membrane or the cell membrane is another selectively permeable structure. So some things are able to move across this barrier like by um, um, osmosis uh, or I should say, excuse me, diffusion. Um, others cannot cross the barrier, at least not easily, due to their size or their electrical charge. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to tell you about it? Um, lipids cross this barrier most quickly due to the um, high lipid content in the plasma membrane. And um, smaller molecules, I'm just looking to see what, what you have in your notes and what you don't have in your notes, like amino acids and sugars and water, they're able to cross this barrier rather readily. Okay, uh, now within this um, phospholipid bilayer, all right, so like... Um, sandwiched between the two layers of phospholipids, there are a variety of enzymes located in this area. And I'm not gonna be very specific about that right now, but all I'm gonna say is that there are some metabolic reactions, or at least um, parts of metabolic reactions that take place right there um, using those enzymes that are uh, located within that barrier known as the uh, cell membrane. Okay, uh, let's talk cytoplasm next. It's a, um, a gelatinous um, fluid, semi-fluid. Uh, uh, we sometimes refer to as a semi-fluid matrix, meaning it isn't quite liquid, isn't quite solid. It's sort of a, that in-between state. And matrix meaning we're going to find a variety of um, um, things um, inside the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is made up of 80% water. And then we'll find the uh, what are known as the macromolecules of life uh, in there as well. And by that, I mean carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. Right? And we're not going to find organelles because, remember, we're talking about prokaryotic cells. But there are areas um, within the uh, cytoplasm of the prokaryotic cell uh, where specialized functions occur. So I'll, I'll get to that in just a minute. All right, oh, uh, most metabolic reactions are going to occur within the cytoplasm. Okay, now I want to talk about, and um, this I know is a very technical term, but let's talk about stuff found in the cytoplasm because I don't want to use the word organelle because 
doesn't apply here. All right, so let's talk about what we find in the uh, cytoplasm of a prokaryotic cell. First of all, it is what's known as the nuclear area, also known as the nucleoid, which means kind of sort of like a nucleus, but not a nucleus. So this is just the area in the cytoplasm where we're gonna find the bacterial chromosome. Now, let me just clarify. I think I've mentioned this previously, but in case I have not, bacteria have one chromosome. Never more, never less. It's a, um, a largish circular molecule. It's for the most part free floating within the cytoplasm, not separated from the rest of the cell by means of a nuclear envelope, or it wouldn't be a bacterium. And so that area in the cytoplasm where the um, bacterial chromosome is located, that's called the nuclear area or the nucleoid. Some bacteria have some extra bits of genetic information, tiny circular molecules of DNA, just to give you perspective. Uh, oh, and they're known as plasmids. Just to give you perspective, a plasmid uh, contains perhaps one one thousandth of the information, genetic information that we would find in that bacterial chromosome. Uh, all right, let me, I'll give you some examples of plasmids, but let me tell you some like generally true facts about plasmids. All right, um, uh, most of the time anyways, they are not connected to the main chromosome. Um, pretty much everything I tell you, you guys, there are exceptions to it. And I don't want to get all sucked up into the exceptions. Let's stick to the basics. Just remember that there are almost always exceptions. Um, all right, plasmids replicate independently of, separately from that main chromosome. Uh, they contain information that allows bacteria to survive in, why don't I describe it as adverse environmental conditions, and I'll try to clarify that in a moment. And um, plasmids can be gained or lost from a cell. Now, let me, before I go on, let me explain what I mean by that. Let's go back to um, my little sketch of bacterial conjugation. I think I mentioned uh, when we talked about this that it is typically um, plasmid DNA that's going to be donated from one cell to another during conjugation. And so um, if all goes well, the donor cell will make a copy of its plasmid DNA and then the copy gets transported uh, uh, through that uh, hollow sex pilus into the cytoplasm of the recipient cell. Uh, sometimes though things go awry and a copy does not get made and the donor cell ships the only copy of the plasmid um, that it had to the recipient cell. So anyways, um, that's what I mean when I say that plasmids can be gained or even lost uh, from a cell and that would be through conjugation. All right, I've got three examples of plasmids that I want to um, describe for you and hopefully this will help you understand uh, some of the statements that I made about general remarks. Um, so let's do that. All right, first example of a bacterial plasmid is called a dissimilation plasmid. Now this type of plasmid allows bacteria to metabolize, um, let's say, unusual metabolic um, substances. Let me make a really simple, over, overly simplified um, uh, example up for you. Let's say we have a bacterium that, if it's present in the environment, uh, pre, um, prefers to metabolize, metabolize excuse me, the carbohydrate known as lactose. Let's say all of the lactose in the environment is consumed. Uh, if the bacterium is not metabolically diverse, you know, for example, by having a dissimilation plasmid or two, um, it's going to perish. Uh, but if it does have one or more of these dissimilation plasmids, that may contain instructions on how to metabolize uh, something else, something more complex, something else that may be found in the environment. And so if the bacterium has that genetic information, it may be able to survive um, in, a, in an environment where it otherwise would have perished. All right, the second example of a plasmid is called a bacteriocinogenic plasmid. All right, now, organisms, cells that have this type of plasmid, they are able to produce proteins called bacteriocins. And these bacteriocins are toxic to other species of bacteria. So this is a situation where if you can uh, produce and release these bacteriocins into the environment, kills off the competition, right? It doesn't kill your own species. Other species will be killed by the bacteriocins, though. 
And so um, you have more space, more oxygen, if you're into that, um, more um, um, nutrients available. Um, okay, now uh, I wanted to mention that this has some uh, uh, practical um, uh, meaning to us, the production of these bacteriosins. Uh, there is a, um, an antibiotic called bacitracin, right? And it's um, used as a topical, very effective against some highly drug-resistant bacteria, including Staphylococcus aureus, uh, the MRSA strain, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and this um, bacitracin is actually uh, the product of a bacterium named, another bacterium named Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a nasty, or no, I'm sorry, I, I just told you a lie, Pseudomonas fluorescens, kissing cousin to Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So this bacteriocin is produced by Pseudomonas fluorescens, right? So it's a naturally producing substance, and this has, uh, this knowledge that, that we learned about this bacteria and killing Staph aureus, uh, we have harnessed that and produced an antibiotic that can help us out. So I think that's pretty interesting. All right, and then the third type of um, plasmid that I want to discuss with you is called the, it's either called a resistance plasmid or sometimes it's referred to as a resistance factor, um, again, synonymous terms. And th this type of plasmid contains genetic information that allows bacteria to resist the effects of one or more antimicrobial substances, like an antibiotic or a disinfectant, for example. Um, all right, and I think that the uh, advantage of having uh, resistance uh, plasmids is probably fairly obvious. Okay, let's continue our list of stuff in the cytoplasm. Next on my list would be um, ribosomes. All right, now both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells have ribosomes. So are ribosomes organelles? Hmm, well, some people would say yes, but I would say no, because I define organelle in this way. Um, an organelle is a membrane-bound structure. That means there's a membrane surrounding it, separating it from other things. Uh, membrane-bound structure that has a specialized function. Ribosomes have a specialized function. They synthesize proteins, but there's no membrane surrounding them. So I would say technically ribosomes are not an organelle, but both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells have ribosomes. Uh, there are some differences between them. Uh, prokaryotic ribosomes are a little smaller. We refer to them as 70S in size. That is a, um, um, a unit of measurement based on the rate of sedimentation when you centrifuge something, meaning spin it very rapidly, um, heavier substances will settle lower in the test tube, lighter substances higher. Okay, enough on that, right? Uh, so prokaryotic ribosomes, they are 70S, um, and uh, eukaryotic ribosomes are a little bit larger, a little bit more complex, and they're referred to as being 80S ribosomes in their size. Uh, all right, but um, so what do ribosomes do? They synthesize proteins, and there are thousands, I'm talking prokaryotic cells now, you guys, thousands of ribosomes, uh, like sprinkled, like you took pepper and threw it into egg white, uh, throughout the cytoplasm. Uh, they're made up of the nucleic acid known as RNA, right? Uh, ribonucleic acid and protein. So they're made of RNA and protein. Um, and um, we talked about the differences in prokaryotic and eukaryotic ribosomes. Now, here's an interesting fact. Uh, because of those differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic ribosomes, there are antibiotics that specifically target, disrupt, destroy, inhibit the function of 70S ribosomes. So what that means is, is that these drugs, and I gave you three examples in your notes, streptomycin, neomycin, tetracycline, there are others, uh, but those and other drugs inhibit protein synthesis in uh, prokaryotic cells only, and that will uh, kill the bacterium. Okay, um, inclusions. This is a, um, a kind of a catch-all term for reserve deposits, um, often of metabolic materials uh, in the um, cytoplasm of the bacterium. Let's say we have um, a bacterium that's capable of 
uh, metabolizing sulfur-containing compounds. Well, if there is an excess of the uh, nutrient material in the environment, the bacteria may sort of, um, uh, kind of make a little package of sulfur, uh, they call them sulfur granules, and store those in the cytoplasm for leaner times. And the examples I gave you included sulfur granules, lipid inclusions, uh, lipid deposits, and um, polysaccharide granules. So those are just three examples of inclusions. All right, I don't know how long I've been uh, talking, so I think I'm going to go ahead and break. And we'll finish this up, I promise, with um, one last segment where I will talk about um, uh, gas vacuoles. Um, we're still talking stuff in the cytoplasm, and then uh, we'll wrap it up with endospores. Okay, guys, thanks. Talk to you later.